Hey, good morning, everybody. Everybody here, the brave detour physical location. Everyone who's watching as part of our online community, we miss you today. I hope we're back together uh, next weekend. It's cold out, yo. It's cold on this platform. It's cold in this church today. But I'm so grateful for everybody that's coming out today. We're in week two of a series that we're calling Pursue. It's been our, our word for the year. It's the word of our, our Devo over the last couple of weeks. And last week we talked about the word Pursue is the act of seeking completely. But today I want to go in week two. It's listening constantly. Can I tell you, listening in 2024 is a lost art form. We don't listen to our teachers, we don't listen to our bosses, we don't listen to our coaches, we don't listen to our spouses. Okay. <laughs> Last week I got home, Rach was sick, and I got home and we were talking about something and about two hours later she asked me a question about the exact thing I had told her two hours earlier. And I just looked at her and she goes, I'm sorry I wasn't listening, okay. <laughs> See, we have a, a, a vision around raising up new leaders this year to take leadership to the next level. But I, I have to tell you, if you wanna be a good leader, you first have to be a good listener. So you need to know today that, that God is always speaking, but we are rarely listening. How do I know that? Because so many times I approach the new year with resolutions, just maybe like you have as well. And maybe some years I wanted to read more books or save more money or finish that degree or work out more. You see, that one didn't keep very well. Sorry, right, don't judge me. And I'm not against resolutions. Not against resolutions at all, but God's direction should always be greater than our desires. God's direction for our life in the new year should be greater than our desires. And as I was putting this message together over the last couple weeks, I had every intention of coming to you and talking about how do we listen constantly to God? And we're gonna go into some of that today, but over the last several days as I've been spending time in God's presence, as I've been trying to remove the voices and the distractions so I could clearly hear from God, I believe that he gave us a word for this church in 2024. He gave us a charge in 2024. And so today, I wanna be obedient to what the Lord has put on my heart. And so today, if it sounds like two messages put into one, it's because it is. Some of y'all that are watching this part of our online community, two messages, I'm glad we stayed home today. I know that boy's gonna go over. No, I ain't. I'm gonna prove y'all wrong today. See, I, I went to an, an unexpected uh, a place in God's word, I thought, God, what would you like me to share with the people of Riverside today? And I think so many times we've heard uh, listening to the voice of God, and I think we have to be really careful of demystizing that, that phrase because I think we read the Old Testament and we see God speaking in an audible voice to Adam, don't don't eat from the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He, he speaks to Noah, go build the ark. The audible voice of God says to Noah, uh, take off your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. And can I tell you, I think in, in this culture today, the audible voice of God doesn't happen very often. It can happen, but can I tell you, as 46 years of standing on this platform today, I've never heard the audible voice of God. See, I wanna be really practical with you from the jump today. There are three primary ways that, that the Lord speaks to me. And if you're taking notes today, I want you to write these down. How can we clearly hear and listen constantly to the voice of God? I think number one, it starts with what I call passages. I shared with you last week that when I was a 19-year-old kid, I was in the UK, and at my, at my lowest point, I finally reached out, opened up God's word, and God's word spoke to me in the midst of my brokenness. So you need to know that reading the Bible isn't information, it's actually an invitation. When you open up the Bible every single time, it's coming and saying, God, what do you want to speak to me today? Every single morning when I sit in God's word and I open it up to wherever he leads me, God, what do you want to speak to me today? See, reading the Bible is not what I have to do, it's what I get to do. 
See, I think so many of us that have this goal to read more of God's word in 2024, it's great and sometimes it almost feels like a to-do list at times. And if you're like me at times, I I just think, oh God, do I really have to do it? It's one more thing I just wanna sleep in today. But can I tell you that the Lord over the last couple of years has been changing my posture when it comes to reading his word. And so now I no longer see it as an irritation. I actually see it as, as as a place where God's gonna speak to me, I now come with expectation. God, what do you wanna speak to me in real time? See, the Lord has been stirring something in me over these first 14 days of a 21 day of prayer and fasting. Anytime that God stirs something new in me, what do I do with that? I always go to God's word. See, the stirring of God should always lead to the studying of his word. Even earlier this week, I was in this place where the Lord was speaking something new and I, I, I've been very honest with you that sometimes I struggle with worry. God, how's that gonna happen? How are you gonna provide for that? Are you sure, God, that that's, I'm hearing right from you? And he, he, he led me to a passage I'd read so many times, but it provided such comfort in the midst of what I was walking through in real time. And it's found in Joshua 1, verse six through nine. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Did you catch it? Three times over the course of four verses, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. See, that was a word that spoke to me right from the jump at the beginning of this week. And can I tell you, over these first two weeks of the year, I've worried less and I've worshiped more. You wanna know, and you wanna know how to hear the voice of God, get into his word. God's gonna speak to you in the midst of whatever you're walking through in real time. But in my life, it's not only passages, but it's secondly, people. God uses people to speak into my life. I hear the voice of God through the people that are in my life. Just this week, uh, on Monday afternoon, I had an incredibly busy afternoon, and if I'm honest with you, I I wasn't really looking forward to it. There wasn't time to breathe. There, There wasn't time for anything. It was just one thing after another, but the most incredible thing happened as I went from one meeting to the next, to the next, to the next. Can I tell you? God was speaking through every single person I was sitting down with. See, the new thing that God was stirring in me, God was confirming through each and every person. See, I think sometimes we think that God only speaks to us in in the quiet. That sometimes it's only when we open up God's word and and that God is gonna speak to us only then, And, and that's true. So many times God speaks to me in the early mornings when everybody in my home is sleeping. God will sometimes speak to us in the midst of the calm, but other times he will speak to us in the midst of the conversation. That's why we always have to be listening. See, one of my last meetings on Monday, my boy Danny Walker, he's my armor bearer in the 11 o'clock service, and as I was sitting with him, we were talking about our kids and raising our kids according to God's standards and how hard it is in 2024 to raise incredible kids in a crazy culture. And as we were talking, the Lord just started to download things in my heart. I started to hear the voice of God. I pulled out my phone so I didn't miss it in that moment. See, God is always speaking. We have to get to this place where we are always listening. See, those people don't even know that God was using them to speak into my situation. That God was using them to speak into what God was speaking to me in real time. See, sometimes God will use people like that. Sometimes God will use people to speak into your life passively, but sometimes he will use people to speak into your life prophetically. 
See, the word prophecy comes from the Greek word, meaning to speak on behalf of God. See, prophecy are supernatural words that are spoken by someone who is full of the Holy Spirit. See, prophecy are not predictions. Prophecy isn't a reading. See, prophets, prophets that still operate today in the gift of prophecy aren't fortune tellers, they're not mediums, they're not people who, dare I say, are led by the spirit of Satan. If you are going to those kind of people, psychics, fortune tellers, mediums, they are not led by the spirit of God, they are led by the spirit of the enemy. We have too many Christians that are now digging into some of that. And let me read my horoscope. I hope somebody reads my palm. That has no business in the life of a believer. No business in the life of a believer. See, the gift of prophecy is available to any of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. Dare I say, it's a gift that we should all want to attain. You read what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. See, the gifts of the Spirit are are things that so often we don't talk about. It's things that we think were just for the early church. They no longer operate. Can I tell you, here at Riverside, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe that the gifts are still operating today. And dare I say, we need those gifts more in 2024 than ever before. And see, we want to, I'm going to already give you a plug. You see, we just kicked off the winter semester of midweek activities. We're already planning the the spring semester, and we're doing a a course all about the gifts of the Spirit. My boy Patrick, one of our elders, along with Anita, who leads our prayer and prophetic ministries, they're going to lead 10 weeks of teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. If you're interested in learning more about what that is, man, I want you to make it a priority. We're going to let you know when it kicks off mid-March. It's going to be incredible. Incredible teaching. Man, you want to hear from the voice of God today? Make your way down to the lower level following service. Our prophetic team has been waiting. These are men and women that hear from God. You need to know from me as the pastor of this house, we do not just allow anybody to be on our prayer and prophetic teams. These are men and women that we know have a relationship with Jesus, that we know that hear the voice of God, that that are men and women that are going to continue to go down the right path. Why? Because there's lots of people in, in 2024 that love the title of pastor, apostle, prophet. And I don't know if you've ever been around any of those people, and when you're around them, it's a little bit off, because what did Paul say? The gift of prophecy should always be used to strengthen, to encourage, to comfort. If you have a prophetic word that's spoken over your life and you leave feeling worse about yourself than when you showed up, dare I say that's not a true prophetic word from God. See, I said last week that the devil will use distraction to come against us, but dare I say the devil will also use deceit. He will bring men and women, quote unquote, Christian men and women in our circle. And before you know it, you are heading down a path than the one that God orchestrated for you all those years ago. You have to have the right people to speak into your life. I don't open myself up for Joe Blow off the street to say, I got a prophetic word for you, pastor. No, thank you today, Joe. I'm going to keep moving. But the people I trust people I've done life with, the proof is in the pudding. I know that they're led by the Spirit. See, in some of you right now, even getting around people, allowing people to speak into your life, it's so hard for you to do because you've been hurt by people. You've been hurt by Christians. You've been hurt by the church. And now I'm not even gonna get around people anymore because you, you've realized that the people that talk you up in public are the same people that tear you down in private. See, we've all been there. We've all been there. Can I tell you, 
One of the most difficult seasons of Rachel and I, our life was in the midst of transition. There was about a six month period of time where I look back, I'm so grateful that God got us through it, but I never wanna repeat it ever again. And one of the things that happened in the midst of all the chaos, all the hurt, is throughout that, Rachel and I said from day one, Michael, moving forward, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have thick skin and a soft heart. Thick skin, soft heart. We're not gonna let everything come against us, but we don't wanna get so hardened that we don't love people. See, when you're hurt, we have two choices. We can either be hardened or we can be healed. See, we have a choice right now. You may have been hurt in a season, but you're not meant to stay there. You're not meant to stay hardened. You're actually meant to stay healed. You will never be healed in isolation. It's only coming around Christian community. Kayla wrote it so beautifully in our Devo about the importance of getting around people to encourage us, to love us. That was a word, Kayla. Thank you so much. That was so encouraging to me. Thank you. See, so what does that look like? How does God speak to us? See, God speaks to us through passages. God speaks to us through people. And thirdly, he speaks to us through prayer. Speaks to us through prayer. And over these last two weeks, I gotta tell you, my prayer life has just been next level. I've been intentional of spending time with God every single day. And can I tell you what I've seen in the last 14 days as I've spent intentional time in prayer, three things that I've seen every single day. Number one, God has comforted me. See, I think we think, well, we're gonna do 40, 14 days uh, of prayer and fasting, 21 days of prayer and fasting, and everything's gonna be easy. There's never gonna be any hardships. There's never gonna be any temptations. There's never gonna be any hurt feelings. And can I tell you, in 14 days, there are times that it's still been tough. Still been rough days, but I felt God's comfort every single day in the midst of what I'm walking through. But can I tell you the second thing I felt? I felt God's commitment to me. That even in those 14 days when I messed up, when I made a mistake, when I've sinned, can I tell you every single time I come to God, he comes and says, I'm committed to you. I'm not letting you go. You're my son. I have greater plans for you. You're not stuck where you are. I'm still committed to you. And see, the third thing that I felt every single day is God's compassion. I felt God's love every single day. See, you may feel in this life unloved by people, but can I tell you, you are very loved by your heavenly Father. God loves you so much, man. When you spend time in prayer, you, you feel the compassion of a father like no other before. See, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Did you catch the, the chain of events that, that Paul is saying there? He says, number one, don't worry about anything. And then he says, number two, pray about everything. When we pray, he says, tell God exactly what you need. Number four, thank God for what he's done. Live a life of gratitude. And number five, then you will experience God's peace. The peace is found in the pursuit. The peace of God is found in the pursuit of God. See, when it comes to passages and people and prayer, I'm not telling you just, just pick one. Michael, this week I'm gonna pray. No, I think you need all three of those things to truly hear from God, to pursue God next level like never, like never before. Get into his word, get around people. Start to have an active prayer life because as I sat there with my boy Danny on Monday, I felt the Lord put it on my heart that 2024 is the year of preparation. 2024 at Riverside is the year of preparation. He's looking for a committed group. He's looking for a body of believers. He's looking for an army of men and women that are gonna impact this world for Jesus like never before. But he says it's gonna require three things. I'm talking to our Riverside family today. If you're watching online, hey, I love you that you, turned, that you tuned in and I pray this is a word for you, but today is a family meeting of sort because there are three things that is gonna require for us to step into the call of God 
to do what he's called each and every one of us to do. And as I was praying about God, what does that look like? He led me to the Old Testament. He led me to a collection of books that if I'm totally transparent, I very rarely read. It's the, it's the books of First and Second Kings. First and Second Kings were originally written as, as one continuous text. It spans over 400 years. And, and I think one of my favorite verses in, in the entire Old Testament is 1 Kings 1.1. It says, David was very old, and no, no matter how many blankets covered him, he could not get warm. I love that verse so much. That was me last night. I was King David, no matter how many blankets, or why are you laughing about that over there? No matter how many blankets covered me, I could not get warm. See, David is coming to the end of his life, the end of his reign. He's, he's ruled Israel for 40 years, and he's now getting ready to hand over the leadership mantle to his son Solomon. And Solomon, it starts off really, really promising. It says that he asked God for wisdom and guidance. He, he went to go build a temple because God had directed him. But then it goes on to say that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I'm always blown away in the Old Testament. These dudes that are rocking with multiple wives. I got one and that's a handful most days, yo. And so what happens is that, is that Solomon's attention is drawn away from the one true God. Solomon starts to worship the gods of his wives and his concubines. I'm getting ready to preach a series called Mixtape that we're kicking off in February. And, I, and what I, I just keep coming back to, the, the wrong people will always take you to the wrong places. The wrong relationships will always take you to the wrong places. And before you know it, Solomon is leading the Israelites in a completely different direction. He rules, he rules for 40 years, and you pick back up in his story that his son Rehoboam takes over. Rehoboam, under his leadership, the nation of Israel splits. It splits into a northern kingdom made out of 10 tribes and the southern kingdom made out of two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Judah has many kings that come through. But today I want to look at the 16th king of Judah. He was a man named Josiah. Josiah becomes the king of Judah when he's only eight years old. Can you imagine being king when you are eight years old? I was still watching cartoons, drinking Capri Suns, probably eating my boogers still. I don't know. Okay, don't judge me. And, and what we see is that Josiah becomes an incredible king. See, I want you to join me today in 2 Kings 23, starting in verse one. Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest, there the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll, and all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. See, can I tell you today, what is God looking for in a year of preparation? What are the identifying marks of a pursuing Christian? I want you to write this down. Number one, it's hunger. God's looking for people who are hungry. Hungry for him. See, one of the hardest things about being a preacher in 2024 isn't, isn't preaching hard messages. It's not preaching against culture. It's not preaching to uh, a very diversified church family. If I'm truly honest, one of the hardest things about being a preacher in, in this church is, is attention spans. People will always tell you if you go too long. 
People will always be able to tell you, man, Michael, that was too long. You lost me about seven minutes into it. And, and you need to know that I, I did some research and our attention spans have dropped off 70% in the last 20 years. We cannot keep our attention for anything. I, I read a report at the end of last year and, and they said, the people that have the greatest following on TikTok, the people who are most effective, they said their clips are anywhere from 21 to 34 seconds. That is all the attention. If it's longer than that, people aren't gonna watch your video. People are gonna move on. I was thinking about this just this week as I was thinking, man, attention spans. Man, I cannot, man, keep time in God's word or listen to a longer message. I just don't have the attention span anymore. And it was funny, as I was working on this message earlier this week, my, my daughter DM me and she said, hey, you, you've got to see this video. Show them the video, yo. She's like, I hate it when people do that. When you're like trying to wrap it up and you say, dad, you're like, I've gone on too long and there's all something in the back. Like, take your time, pastor. Keep going, pastor. She's like, no, <laughs> wrap it up. Land the plane. <laughs> Three hour church services. She's like, there in no way, but some of y'all will go home today and you'll watch 10 hours of football playoffs, yo. Some of y'all gonna be on the couch till 10 p.m., shut up. <laughs> See, I, I think so many of us, we get to this place where we need to have this desire for the hunger for the things of God. See, you will, you will get out of it what you put into it. A limited desire will always lead you to a limited destiny. A limited desire for the things of God will always lead you to a limited destiny for what God has for you. You will never fully step into the fullness of God if you don't have a hunger for him. See, my prayer is that we have a hunger for God's word, a hunger for the things of the spirit, a hunger to draw closer to him and a hunger to draw closer to one another. See, there are some of us that are doing this fast and you're looking forward to next Sunday where the fast is over and you can go back to normal. So is your bro. I'm looking for a, a caffeinated cup of coffee next week. I cannot wait. Decaf is from the devil, yo. <laughs> See, and I think too many times we get to the place where I will continue beyond these 21 days if God shows up. I'll continue to make time for him. I'll continue to turn off the TV. I'll continue to fast. I'll continue to, to spend time in prayer if God answers my prayer. And can I tell you, God isn't looking for conditional commitment. He's actually looking to committed commitment. He's looking to, for complete commitment commitment from every single one of us, not if God shows up on our timetable. See, when you look at that passage, when you go back and you read about Josiah, did you notice how inclusive it is in nature in the text? He says, all the elders, all the people, they read the entire book of the covenant. He said, God, I will keep all your commands, all your laws, all your decrees with all my heart, all my soul, and it says, all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. They were all in. Did you notice that hunger is infectious? Josiah said, hey, God, I'm all in. Whatever you want to show me, I'm agreeing to your word. I, I want to be all in, all in my soul, all in my spirit, whatever you call me to do. And it said that every single person that was in the vicinity, all the people that drew themselves in were committed to God as well. Hunger is infectious. Hunger just doesn't affect you, it affects others. See, when God does something new in you, people will start to ask, people will start to notice something. See, there's a hunger in this church like never before. 
We see God add to our numbers over the last 12 months. We've seen a hunger on Wednesday nights for people to dive deeper into God's word. Almost 300 people coming out on a Wednesday night. We've seen connect groups that just continue to grow and grow and grow. See, hunger isn't about us. Other people will notice. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about. Jesus died, he was buried, he resurrected. And some of the last things he said before he ascended into heaven is found in Matthew 28. Listen to what he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, the, the Lord is improving you so that you can impact others. See, you need to know in these first 21 days, God is improving you so now you can go and impact others. It's not meant to stay in this room. It's not meant to stay in your home, in your quiet space. You're meant to go tell others about Jesus. See, it's only gonna happen when we have a hunger for God, when we have a hunger for his presence, when we have a hunger for his word. See, one of my favorite moments, one of my favorite memories of growing up is that every single night, my mom would, would come in and she would read me a story. She would read me a book. And after 15, 20 minutes, she'd say, Michael, that's enough for tonight. And I would always go, Mom, one more page. Mom, just one more page. I wanna see what happens. Mom, tell me more. What if we came to the Lord with the same posture? God, tell me more, show me more, lead me more, fill me more. Lord, I wanna seek more of you than I ever have before. I want 2024 to look different than 23 and 22 and 21 and definitely better than 20, yo. Lord, I want more of you. So you continue to read in, in 2 Kings, picking up in verse four, then the king instructed Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second rank and the temple gatekeepers to remove from the Lord's temple all the articles that were used to worship Baal and Asherah and the powers of the heavens. The king had all these things burned outside Jerusalem on the terrace of the Kidron Valley, and he carried the ashes away to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests who had been appointed by the previous kings of Judah for they had offered sacrifices at the pagan shrines throughout Judah and even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. They had also offered sacrifices to Baal and to the sun, the moon, the constellations, to all the powers of the heavens. The king removed the Asherah pole from the Lord's temple and took it outside Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley where he burned it. Then he ground the ashes of the pole to dust and threw the dust over the graves of the people. He also tore down the living quarters of the male and female shrine prostitutes that were inside the temple of the Lord, where the women wove coverings for the Asherah pole. See, in the new year, we're gonna be men and women defined by our hunger, but also by our holiness. We're gonna be men and women that are defined by our holiness. See, the Hebrew word for holiness is kedusha. It's the idea of being separated from one thing and being dedicated to something else. In our sense, it's being separated from our sin and being dedicated to our Savior. See, as you step into the new year of 2024, God doesn't want you to walk into it still tethered to your old sins of 2023. He wants you completely devoted to him over and over again. See, you need to know that time and time again, you have to do something drastic to your sin before your sin does something drastic to you. In 2024, we have to be men and women of holiness. See, growing up, I remember that every single Sunday night, we had Sunday night service, and yes, my mom took me Sunday morning and Sunday night. I didn't like it, but I went. And every single Sunday night, we'd go out to Steak and Shake, and, and we would eat, and uh, my grandpa would so often be there, and he would always give me whatever change he had in his pocket, and he'd leave it on the table. And I thought, I was like winning the jackpot to go home with 27 cents some Sunday nights. 
And I remember, I don't know why I did this, but there was a nickel sitting there and I just started to bite on a nickel. I was a weird kid, yo. And, and before I knew it, I accidentally swallowed that nickel. And I just felt a goal, and I didn't tell anybody. To this day, I haven't told anybody this story. And, and I swallowed this. And I didn't think anything of it until uh, the very next day, my mom said, hey, today's Monday, tomorrow on Tuesday, we, we gotta go and we gotta get an x-ray of your lungs. Because I was a kid that battled severe asthma growing up, and so every six months I had to go get these, these x-rays. And can I tell you, for the next 24 hours, I worried that I was gonna go get an x-ray and, and that nickel was gonna show up in my lungs. I didn't know how anatomy worked, yo. And I showed up, they put that big old heavy thing on me and I stood there and the whole time, I never prayed to Jesus quite as much as I prayed in that morning. And I was just like, Lord, and the, and the radiologist came back up and he was holding the x-rays and I was like, this is the moment of truth. My mom's gonna see it and they're gonna be, he had a blockage in his lung. And the guy held it up to the light and shone it through and I was looking at that, I was studying that thing. I never studied for a quiz harder than I was studying, looking at those things. There wasn't a single thing on the x-ray and the guy goes, looks perfect. And I like let out a sigh of relief because nobody ever found out what I See, I think so many of us are stepping into 2024. We are hiding things and holding our breath, just hoping that nobody finds out what I did, what I'm involved with, what keeps a hold of me night after night, day after day. But when you read Hebrews 4.13, it says nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. See, we can come in here and we can we can use Christian words. We can come in here and we can, we can hide things from our spouse. We can, we can come in here and, and, and wear the mask and mask our sin, but it says nothing is hidden, everything is exposed. Can I, can I tell you, what you are hiding is a hindrance to your holiness. What you are hiding is a hindrance to your holiness. See, we've got to start dealing with our stuff. We've got to look inside ourselves and what is the stuff in our lives? See, over these first 14 days, I'm dealing with stuff that I put off with for 46 years. Hurts, insecurity, sin, things I've tried to cover up, things in my marriage, my parenting fails, my leadership fails, and right now I'm at the place, God, I wanna be an open book, show me. I don't wanna allow anything to hinder me where you're taking me in regards to my holiness, to regards to my righteousness. God, show me what does that look like. Hebrews 12, five through 11 says, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you're not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening, it's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. See, last week we talked about divine direction, but what do we hear about this week? Divine discipline. 
See, Christians, followers of Jesus, have you, have you forgotten when you fell in love with Jesus? That moment of justification, that moment when you came to him and said, I'm giving my life to you. I'm going to obey all your commands. I'm going to live a life of righteousness. But what started to happen is through a series of choices, a series of events, you started to wander farther and farther and farther away from him. You started to drift. Can I tell you, in my life, how I've learned, drifting is dangerous. When you start to drift, when you start to overlook your sin, before you know it, you are going down a path that God never intended for you to go down. See, as we sit with God, he will console us, but he will, he will also convict us. I said last week that, that God's word comforts us. God's word consoles us, but it will also convict us. See, there are, there are times where I've, I've read my, my Bible late at night, and I don't know if you ever read the verse, your body is a temple, and you've just treated your body like crap all day long, eating raw cookie dough like it's going out of style. Don't judge me. And, and you read those, and you're like, I haven't been taking care of my body in terms of what I'm eating, what I'm watching, what I'm allowing my body to take part in. Or you read verses like, love your enemies, and you just got done gossiping about somebody running somebody's name down. See, sometimes God comforts us in his word, but sometimes God also convicts us. See, and when, when God corrects us, correction isn't condemnation, correction is actually compassion. When God corrects you, it's not to condemn you. He actually is correcting you to show his compassion to rain down on you. It's why we correct our kids. It's not because we don't love them. It's actually because we do. When I love my kids so much that I have to correct them. I have to teach them. I have to help them learn new things. I have to show them so they don't continue down this same path. See, sometimes... The Lord has to expose our sin so we can experience his grace. Sometimes God has to expose our sin so we can experience his grace. See, can I ask you today, what is hindering your holiness? What are the things in your life that are hindering you stepping into the fullness of God? See, removal is painful but removal is pivotal. Removal of things in our lives are painful, but removal is pivotal. It's important. See, removal of things in our life isn't always easy. It isn't painless, but it is powerful because when you start to remove the things that are keeping you from an authentic relationship with Jesus, there's no telling how God can use you. There's no telling how he's going to use this church in 2024 as we have an a honest conversation. And God, we surrender it all to you. Show us what is not of you. We want to live lives of holiness. See, my prayer is that people talk about us like the author talks about Josiah. 2 Kings 23, 25, never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul his strength, obeying all the laws of Moses, and there has never been a king like him since. See, what was Josiah? Josiah was marked out by his hunger. He was, he was marked out by his holiness. And third and finally, he was marked out by his humility. He was marked out by his humility. See, just a few weeks ago, Rachel and I, after service, were standing at the door, and some, a couple came up to us, and, and the girl was very giddy. And I was like, hi, have I met you before? And she's like, no, we've been watching online for a long time, and we finally came, and this is our, our first week in person. It's like meeting celebrities. And there was a moment where I was like, okay. 
yes, let's go for about 0.3 seconds. And the Lord is like, nah, you're not that important, bro. I kid you not. There was a moment when my shoulders would look back. I was like, okay, let's go. And the Lord is clearly, like I'm talking, the, how the Lord can speak in the midst of the calm, in the midst of the conversation. It was right there. And he's like, you're not that important. We're not that important, yo. See, I think one of the biggest barriers to pursuing is pride. I think one of the biggest barriers for us pursuing a relationship with Jesus is pride. We think it's, it's distractions. We, we think it's time. We think it's our schedules, our kids, our relationships. But one of the biggest barriers to pursuing is pride. Listen to what it says, Proverbs 11:2. 2. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. See, in 2024, you can be disgraced or you can be developed. You can live a life of pride and you can be disgraced or you can be developed. See, I pray that we grow in wisdom. I pray that we grow in knowledge. I pray that this year we grow in understanding, but that we grow in the things of God. See, what I found in my life is that we're great at making plans. We're great at making timelines, great at making resolutions. But what I've learned is that when we do those things and we don't come to God about any of them, we're actually saying, God, I'm more important than you are. Let me show you what I wanna happen in 2024. Let me keep grinding, let me keep working, let me keep pursuing my academics, my, my job, my business. God, I'm more important than you. But when you read this passage, Josiah says he turned to the Lord with all his heart, all his soul, all his strength. He didn't come to God with an agenda. He actually came with humility. He came to God and say, I, I surrender it all to you. See, that's a humble spirit. A humble spirit surrenders. A humble spirit says, I trust in you. A humble spirit says, I understand you are God and I am not and I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna rest in you. Proverbs 4, 10 through 13 says, my child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom ways and lead you in straight paths. When you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions, don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. What does it say? This is Solomon speaking here. I will teach you and I will lead you. See, I, I don't think those are, those are put in that sequence just haphazardly. See, so many of us, we've gotta be taught before we lead. Lots of people wanna be leaders. Not a lot of people wanna learn. See, in 2024, I pray that we have a posture of humility. God, let me be a student of your word. Lord, let me, let me learn from the master. Bring the right people around me. Let me find out more about what you wanna teach me in 2024. See, that's who I wanna be over and over and over again. See, my prayer for our church is that in 2024, number one, that we would learn more. That we would get to this place where we're hungry for God. We're hungry for his word, we're memorizing, we're meditating on scripture. God, I just wanna learn more. I wanna be a student, I wanna be active, but I don't wanna learn more, I wanna listen up. I wanna listen constantly. I wanna be so led by the sound of your voice. I wanna be so aware of your presence that you can speak to me in the midst of the quiet or the midst of the conversation and whatever you say, I'm gonna listen. 
But I want us to get to the place where we're learning more. We're listening up, but we're leaning into the presence of God like never before. God, I'm no longer gonna try to do it on my own. I'm no longer gonna try to give you my agenda and ask you to sign off on it. No, God, in this new year, I'm gonna be postured. I'm gonna surrender it all to you. Why? Because you are God and I am not, and I'm going to allow your presence, your voice to lead me every single step of the way. So your will will be done, not my own. See today, will you stand? I just wanna pray for us, that's our charge in this new year, it's what the Lord's put on my heart. And for those of you who call yourself a part of this Riverside family, I know you do, because you brave the elements today to get here. You're committed to this house. Whatever it looks like in 2024, I wanna be a part of it. But it's gonna require us a hunger like never before. It's gonna require us to have a holiness. We gotta get rid of the stuff. We've gotta have a holiness for the things of God like never before we gotta have a humility. I can't do it on my own. I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. God, I give it all to you. And so dear Heavenly Father, you see this space full of people today, space full of people, everybody that's watching at home today, Lord Jesus. That's the charge. That's the charge you gave us, Lord, as we step into 2024, the year of preparation, God, it's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be worth it. Lord, I pray that right now you would reveal the things in our lives that are not of you. Lord, I pray that you would convict us. You're not convicting us to condemn us, you're actually convicting us to show us how much you love us. You're exposing things in our lives so we can experience your grace. And Lord, I pray right now, this would just be a moment of confession. Lord, I'm sorry for the things I continue to hold on to. I'm sorry for the things I continue to surround myself with, the things I continue to say, the things I continue to look at, the places we continue to go, Lord Jesus. We give it all to you right now, Lord Jesus. Wash us clean as snow. We don't wanna go without you, Lord. And we come with a posture of humility. Lord, we don't wanna move on our own desires. We don't wanna give you our, our own timetable and ask you to make it happen. God, we wanna trust you. We're gonna have a posture of sacrifice and surrender for the next 51 weeks of this new year, Lord. Whatever you wanna do, we're here. Wherever you wanna take us, we're here. Whatever you wanna speak, God, we're here. We trust you every single step of the way. Lord, have your way. We wanna be listening constantly and guided by your presence. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're doing in this space, what you're doing in homes all around this area today. And Lord, the new thing that you wanna do in and through this church. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. We're so grateful. Thank you guys for joining us today. Have the best week. Stay warm.